Harvey, 911, what is your emergency? Oh, What's going on, ma'am? I'm dying, not whatever. Okay, let me transfer you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get uh, fire department online, okay? Hold on one sec, okay? Department. Ma'am, are you still there? Ma'am, are you still there? All I've got is she's telling me she's dying. I'm getting... I've got a... Are you still there, ma'am? Ma'am, what is your address? Hi guys, welcome back for another Twisted Tea video. I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front for this one, both for what you're going to see in here and for having to watch me cry because I am absolutely sure that I'm going to at some point while recording this one. This story is extremely sad and has stuck with me since I first heard about it in 2008. The voice you heard on that 911 call was that of 17 year old Sarah Saeed. And yes, she did say I'm dying and my dad shot me and my sister. Her body and the body of her 18-year-old sister, Amina Saeed, would be found in their father's taxi, abandoned outside of a hotel in Irving, Texas, over an hour later. The girls had been shot to death by their father in what was referred to as an honor killing. This one is especially sad for me, but there will be good news and a tribute to the girls at the end of the video if you're able to make it all the way through. This story is extra twisted and I have so much to say, so let's get right into it. Amina and Sarah Saeed were not only sisters, but best friends. They were very close in age and did everything together from playing sports and hanging with friends to fighting off their abusive father. Sarah was a tomboy and kind of quiet and reserved, but she was very rarely seen without a smile on her face. Amina was more of a social butterfly. While she loved sports and karate too, she also liked to wear pink and makeup. Both girls were full of life and just so extremely happy to be alive. Amina had recently started her first job and had only been working for about two weeks when she got promoted to supervisor, which is pretty impressive. This was her first job and she was only 18 and she was there for two weeks. Sarah had recently gotten her first job at a convenience store as well and she was doing really well too. Both girls wanted to be doctors and were in all kinds of extracurricular activities and played every sport possible. Their father, Yasser Abdel Saeed, is an Egyptian born Muslim, born January 27, 1957. He's the oldest of five children. According to his wife and the girls' mother, Patricia, or Tissy as you'll hear me refer to her. He came to America in 1983 because he had gotten into an altercation with a co-worker and ran him over multiple times and ultimately killed him. Yasser's dad reportedly paid a lot of money to get Yasser acquitted of that charge and sent to the United States on a student visa. All of his siblings followed. Patricia Owen Saeed was a Southern Baptist. She had dated Yasser's brother Yasin and was even engaged to marry him at one point before her and Yasser got married. Tissy and Yasin broke up and Yasser asked Tissy's parents if he could marry her when she was only 15 and he was 30. She said that her family was very poor and she just wanted to get out of the house. Her parents had agreed to the marriage because Yasin and Yasser had convinced them that they had a lot of money and that Tissy would be well taken care of. She admits that she wasn't in love with him at first, but that she did eventually grow to love Yasser over time. They applied to get Yasser's green card immediately after they got married. At first, Tissy says that their relationship was good and loving, but Yasser became controlling just a year after their relationship started. He wouldn't let her have contact with their family because they were American, but she's American and you knew that. She claims now that he abused her throughout the entirety of their marriage. She says that he always told her that he regretted marrying an American and he would terrorize the house and then watch her clean it up. He was just a miserable person to live with. Tissy got pregnant with their first child only a month after their wedding and had their son Islam when she was 16. Amina followed shortly after at 17 and then Sarah when Tissy was 18. Tissy seems to have remained faithful even throughout everything that they went through, but Yasser had at least six affairs that his wife had found out about and even had a daughter with another woman who's only about a year older than their son Islam. Yasser Saeed was very controlling of everyone in the family, but especially so with his daughters Amina and Sarah. He was constantly walking around with a video camera in his hand and was always recording them without their knowledge. This seemed to really bother the girls and frankly it pissed them off, especially Amina. 
Yoster began to sit outside of the convenience store that Sarah was working at and would record and criticize her every move. He made it a family outing of sorts and would even bring along Tissy, Islam, and Amina. Then he would punish her when she got him for being too friendly and smiling at the customers. Here, he's keeping an eerie watch on Sarah at work. She smiled to the customers. Bella, she has to. Part of her job. It's so disturbing hearing Amina stick up for her sister. And it really sounds in the video like Yasser understands. I mean, he worked at a convenience store when he met Tissy. So he definitely gets customer service aspect of that job. I think that he really just wanted to terrorize and frighten these girls. He also recorded Amina and Sarah jumping on the trampoline, walking in and out of school, and at karate. He was literally always lurking around the corner with a video camera. I know that a lot of parents take tons of pictures and videos of their kids, but this just was not normal. He even recorded them while they were trying to sleep, and I'm going to show you that video so you can be the judge of how creepy this really was. Mm. Take this print from this one in the back. Not only is he taunting them while they're in their room trying to sleep, but he's zooming in on private areas and even involved Islam and they're laughing at them. Yasser even bugged Amina's car when she was old enough to start driving herself to karate work in school. The girls were thriving. They were excelling in school, extracurricular activities, and in their social lives, but they seemingly lived a double life. Things really changed for the girls when they got home in the evenings and they couldn't talk about things or people that they cared about or even how their day had gone out of fear about how their dad would react. The girls were starting to date, but knew that their father wouldn't approve, so they kept it a secret and went to extraordinary lengths to keep it hidden from him. Amina had met her boyfriend Joseph Moreno at their karate school. Joseph says that she asked for his number and made up some silly excuse as to why she needed it. But little did she know, he already had his sights set on her too. They hit it off really quickly, and their relationship has been described as your stereotypical teenage love. They were together every day of the week at karate, but Joseph just couldn't make sense of why Amina didn't want to shout this from the rooftops like he did. Amina made Joseph promise that he would keep their relationship a secret once they decided to make it official. But he just couldn't contain himself and he had to tell someone, so he confided in his mother. Joseph's mom really liked Amina and wanted to help her get out of her situation at home. At first, all that Amina had told Joseph about their relationship with her father is how strict and protective he was. But every time she got more comfortable and started to tell him more concerning details about the control and abuse. Joseph told his mom everything as Amina told him and eventually Amina got comfortable and started to confide in Joseph's mother herself. The couple dated for four years and were still deeply in love and talking about running away together and getting married when Amina was taken from him. The girls were being mentally abused by their father at the very least. He was always threatening and belittling them and had always told them about how they would be sold to the highest bidder once they were old enough. The girls were scared to death of arranged marriage and it made them both cringe to think about marrying someone who was twice their age that they didn't even know. Not to mention the fact that they would have to move to another country to do so. When Amina was 16, her father took her to Egypt to meet a 45-year-old prospect that she was possibly going to be arranged to marry. Amina threw a complete fit and told her father that she's American and that she would do anything to be able to pick her own husband. She was completely irate over the fact that her father and uncles were going to sell her and her sister, no matter the circumstances or how it made the girls feel. Amina said on more than one occasion that she would rather die than not be able to pick her own husband. While the abuse seems to have been mostly emotional at this point, that definitely hadn't always been the case. When Amina was only nine and Sarah was eight, Amina had confided in her aunt, Tissy's sister, and told her about how her dad had touched her. When Connie called Tissy to tell her about what the girls had been saying, she immediately came and picked him up and took him to Cook's Children's Hospital to be examined and she called Child Protective Services herself. Tissy and the kids reportedly moved out of Yasser's house and moved in with Tissy's parents. In the report to CPS, Amina accused Yasser of putting his front part in her front part. She went on to say that he had penetrated her with his fingers on multiple occasions and had also touched her breasts. The girls also told the social worker that they were afraid of their dad and their uncles, and that they were scared they were going to take them. Yasser Saeed was arrested, but not for the sexual abuse. He was arrested for retaliation for going after Tissy and the girls for accusing him of sexual abuse. He posted bail, and Yasser and Tissy talked the girls into recanting. The girls did what they were told, but Amina wrote a long, detailed letter to her Aunt Connie before they left, that her mom had made her lie and say that the sexual abuse didn't happen and that they just said that because they wanted to live with their grandparents. But Amina insisted that this wasn't the case and that the sexual abuse in fact did happen. She begged her aunt not to make her go back with her dad. 
Tissy found the letter and took the girls and the letter and left when she found out that Amina had written it. Tissy maintains even now that Yasser would never sexually abuse his daughters. Yasser and Tissy fled to Maryland with the girls in Islam for a few months and then the family went to Egypt until things in Texas could calm down. Amina and Sarah were always looking for creative ways to keep in touch with their boyfriends without their dad finding out. Amina and Joseph began writing letters back and forth to save her from the drama of her dad finding the messages in her phone. Until one day Amina wrote Joseph a letter and Yasser found it and questioned her about it. Amina lied about the letter and told her dad that she was just pretending that she was allowed to have friends and be in love. Yasser didn't buy it though and uprooted the entire family within a couple of days. He made her stop going to karate and school and made her quit her job too. Joseph was completely worried sick. He had no idea what had happened to Amina. She had seemingly just fallen off the face of the earth. They went from talking every day to now he doesn't know where she is. He doesn't know if Yasser hurt her, if they moved, or if he shipped her back off to Egypt. Amina emailed the karate instructor and told him that her father had bought a house in Louisville and moved them within two days of finding out about Joseph. She asked the instructor to tell Jojo, as she called him, that she loved him and that she was all right and that she hoped that they could be together again one day very soon. He reached out to Joseph's mom and dad and asked for their advice on what he should do with the information that Amina had given him in the emails. They were completely thrilled to find out that she was alive and safe and still in the United States. Joseph's mother quickly emailed Amina back without telling her son. Amina told her that her father was insisting that she give him information on who Joseph was and where he lived. Yasser wanted Joseph's address because he wanted to kill him. She also told Joseph's mother that her dad had beat her really bad. She had woken up to him kicking her in the stomach and then repeatedly in the face. It was so bad that her lips were apparently embedded in her braces and she told Joseph's mother that you couldn't tell where her braces ended and her lip began. Amina assured Joseph's mother that she had nothing to worry about and that she would rather die than give up Joseph's name and address. After this exchange, Amina began confiding in Joseph's mother through email saying that her father was again taking her to Egypt to meet potential husbands. She said that she didn't think she should be forced to go and explained how she was going to cause a scene at the airport to stop the trip from happening. She was quoted saying, I'm 17, doesn't the law protect me in some way? She said that she was especially worried about going to Egypt this time because the last time she had gone to Egypt, that people were literally throwing stones at her for being American. She gave Joseph's mother all of her information like social security number and asked if her father took her passport how she could return to the U.S. She did end up going to Egypt with Yasser, but while she was there, she snuck off to an internet cafe to continue the emails with Joseph's mother. She told her that her father, in fact, had taken their American passports. She also said that something was really wrong and she just couldn't put her finger on it. She then asked her to tell Jojo how much she loved him and said she would be in touch with them as soon as she could, but they didn't hear from Amina again until the Saeeds were back in the States. Joseph's parents didn't tell him about the email correspondence between them and Amina at first, not only to protect his feelings, but to protect him physically. Amina continued to email with Joseph's mother and kept begging her to let her talk to Joseph. She eventually caved and gave Jojo Amina's information so that they could talk. Amina was most concerned about Jojo's safety and said, I don't care, he'll have to kill me first. I'd rather die than live without you. She was starting to frantically think and talk about ways to get herself and her sister out of the situation that they were in and how to get rid of their father. She tried to commit suicide and while she was in the hospital, Joseph's mother tried to convince her to tell one of the counselors. Amina said that she just couldn't because she was a minor and the first thing that they would do is tell her mom and dad what she had said. Finally, on Christmas 2017, Amina told Joseph that they had finally done it. She said that her, Sarah, and her mother had finally left to get out from underneath of Yasser. Tissy called her sister and said that Yasser had threatened to kill Amina for dating an American boy. December 26, 2007, Tissy, Amina, and her friend Eddie, and Sarah and her boyfriend Eric ran away to Kansas. Yasser and Islam filled out police reports claiming that Patricia and the girls were missing. Tissy decided that they weren't going to stay at Jill's house and took all four kids to a hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma until they could find a house to rent. December 27, 2007, they signed a lease to an apartment with made-up names so Yasser couldn't find them. Tissy and the girls also destroyed their cell phones and SIM cards and got burner phones. The five of them moved in right away and Tissy quickly got a job and was supposed to start work on Monday. On December 29, 2007, Amina texted Joseph and told him that she was scared because her mother was having second thoughts and felt guilty for abandoning her husband and wanted to go back. Amina again confided in Joseph's mother and told her that she doesn't understand why her mother isn't more like she is. She said she loves me, then why won't she stick up for me? She just could not wrap her mind around the fact that her mother was more for her abusive husband than her daughters. 
According to Tissy, she was only comfortable going back because Yasin had been telling her on the phone that Yasser didn't have to be there, and that he and his brothers would make him leave if it made her and the girls more comfortable. Tissy says that after talking to Yasin, they called Yasser, and that Sarah had talked to him first and then Amina, and that they all agreed to go back willingly. But that wasn't the case at all. On December 30th, 2007, they started the journey home. Eric, Sarah's boyfriend, says that Amina had no idea that Sarah and her mother were planning to go back to Texas to Yasser, and that Amina had not talked to her father the entire time that they were not in Texas. Sarah had agreed to go back to try to keep the peace, but Amina would not have agreed. She hated her father and was scared and mortified of him. The truth was that Tissy had lied to Amina and said that they were going back to Texas to see her family and put flowers on her mother's grave for Christmas. She told Amina that they were going to stay with her family through New Year's, but the truth was that her family didn't even know she was coming back to Texas. But Tissy knew this was the only way she could get Amina to agree to get in the car and go back toward Texas. Somewhere along the ride home, Tissy admits that they are in fact going back to Yasser. Amina got very upset and insisted that she wasn't going back there. She went to her friend Eddie's house when they got back. Sarah and Tissy went home, and Amina spent the night with her friend. On December 31st, 2007, Amina's worst nightmare came true. She finds out that her mother has no intention of going back to Tulsa. Amina called her Aunt Connie that day to tell her that her mom went back to her dad. Connie had no idea. Amina was scared to literal death because she knew that this was going to be the end of her story. She told her aunt that she would rather die than go back. She asked her aunt what she should do. Connie told her to file for a restraining order and get as far away as she could. On the morning of January 1st, 2008, Tissy began to beg Amina to come home starting at 8 a.m. She had even had Sarah send a message to Amina's friend saying to have Amina call her mom as soon as she could. When Amina called, Tissy begged her to come home and Amina refused at first. Tissy claims that Amina actually called her to come pick her up. She says that Amina wanted to come home and get her stuff ready for school in a couple of days. I completely despise this woman. We know this can't be how it went down. Amina had no intention of going back to school there. She definitely would not have been eager to get back to Yasser's house to pack a bag for a school she didn't even want to be at. Amina reached out to Jojo and told her that her mom was begging her to come home. He told her that it was a terrible idea and told her to please promise him that she wouldn't go back there. Amina said she couldn't do that and that she had to do what she had to do. She told him that she loved him one last time before finally agreeing to let her mom come pick her up. The tension was really built up by the time that they got home. That evening, according to Tissy, Yasser said that he was going to take the girls out to dinner to try to sit down and talk with them and rectify things, and she actually let them go. She says that she never could have guessed that their father was actually going to kill them. This woman just makes my blood boil. My heart is broken for these two girls. For them to have a father who treated them the way they did must have been a complete and utter nightmare. But then to make matters worse, having a mother like Tissy who wouldn't even stick up for them is just completely devastating. And I cannot believe that she's a free woman today. Yasser lured the two girls into his cab and didn't even take them to dinner like he had promised before driving them to a parking lot outside of a hotel in Irving, Texas. When the girls were finally found, Amina Saeed was deceased from two gunshot wounds to her chest and Sarah Saeed was also deceased with nine gunshot wounds all over. These two young girls are absolute heroes. They risked their own lives to save the people that they loved and cared about the most. But I think Sarah's especially amazing. She was shot more brutally because she managed to call 911. Her adrenaline kicked in and she was gonna do everything in her power to let someone know who had done this to her and her sister before she let go. The theory is that someone either picked him up or he already had a car there waiting. No random person would have picked him up covered in blood like that. Yasser's brother Yosri said that Tissy was lucky that the girls' bodies were even found to be buried because if it was his daughters, no one would have found their bodies. All of Yosri's daughters have been taken back to Egypt for arranged marriages. The day after the funeral, Tissy moved in with Yasser's brother Mohsen and his wife Mary. According to Tissy, this was because she wanted Islam to be around people that he knew and because he definitely needed a man in his life now more than ever. Tissy said that living with Mohsen, Mary, and their daughters was okay at first until they started making comments about the girls. Mohsen said that Yasser didn't want to raise whores for daughters. Cell phone records had confirmed that Yasser called Mohsen right after Sarah made the 911 call. According to Mohsen and Mary, when Yasser called that night, Mary answered the phone and said that Mohsen was in the shower. Yasser sounded winded and told her to have Mosin meet them at their old meeting spot. Yasser apparently sounded winded and told Mary to have Mosin meet them at their old spot. 
which was a Denny's close to where the girls had been shot. Mary said that Mohsen didn't go, but Tissy is not convinced. She thinks that he definitely could have gone and that Mary would definitely cover for him. Yasin Saeed was Yasser's closest brother. He called Yasin about everything. Yasser had even talked to Yasin for a total of 861 minutes on the phone during the week leading up to the murders of the two girls, typically with several calls in one day. Three and a half hours after Sarah called 911, Yasser and Yasin talked on the phone for 12 minutes. Yasin lived in New York but also had a Texas driver's license. We now know that Yasin helped Yasser escape and gave him his Texas driver's license and car. Amina had heard and wrote about her father and Uncle Yasin talking in a room with the door closed one night, and she said she overheard her father saying that soon she would be just a memory, and this became Amina's biggest fear. Sarah's phone records showed that the line had been open with the 911 call for 42 minutes. When she first called, you can hear that the cab's still moving. Police were tracing the call and trying to locate the cab. They eventually tracked the phone back to Tissy's house somehow. The Irving police picked up Tissy and Sarah's phone and escorted her to the police department. At that point, they still hadn't found the girls' bodies. When they told Tissy about the 911 call, she said that the girls left with their father in a yellow taxi cab and suggested that they call Yellow Cab to get the GPS on the cab. It still took them over an hour to locate the girls' body at the Omni Hotel in Irving. During a raid of the Saeed home after the murders, Tissy was allowed to go in the home and take a few personal belongings that she would need. She decided on a computer, a box of important papers including Yasser's birth certificate, a box of pictures, and a box of tapes from the video camera. All a little suspicious if you ask me. I think they probably meant clothes and personal care items. I feel like she saw this as her opportunity to make herself look innocent and take everything out of the house that incriminated her as well as get things that Yasser might need. The American side of the girls' family was desperate to locate Yasser after the murders. They even went as far as making flyers and handing them out to passerbys on the street corners and at local shops. This upset Tissy for some reason. She even went to the Irving Police Department and said that she didn't want his picture out there and wanted them to make the family stop. The police weren't going to let that happen and pretty much laughed in her face. JoJo's mom woke him up and was hysterical. She had to break her son's heart by telling him that Yasser had shot and killed both Amina and Sarah. Amina had made Joseph promise her that if her father ever went through with it, he would never harm himself. He kept his promise, but was admitted into a psych hospital for a little while to try to bring him back to reality. Islam Saeed was very close to his sisters, but was treated very differently. You could tell that he was way more respected than the girls ever could be. He seemed to blame it all on the girls. He went back and forth for a while right after the murders. He was seen on TV urging his father to turn himself in, and then he claimed that he thought his father was dead, and then he flat out blamed the girls and said that they got what they deserved. A couple of days after the murder, Mohsen and Mary had invited Islam over for dinner one night. A couple of hours after he left to go have dinner with them, Tissy received a call saying that Islam was actually on a plane on his way to Egypt. According to Tissy, they kept him there for three years. Gada Saeed is Yasser's one and only sister. She found herself on the FBI's Most Wanted list, too, for kidnapping her own children after their father had been granted custody. Directly after the hearing, she rushed home, packed a few outfits, and Yasin took her and the kids to Canada. She and the kids stayed there for about a year before fleeing to Cairo, Egypt. Tissy admits to seeing the kids on multiple occasions when they went to Egypt. She admits that she never reported it back then, but after her daughters were murdered, she told the police department and the FBI everything. She believes that when Islam was in Egypt for three years, that he was with Gada. The girls were given a Christian ceremony as well as a Muslim ceremony. At the funeral, Islam recognized Joseph and told him to get the hell out of there and even went as far as saying that this was his fault and that he did this. The girls were eventually buried in the Muslim cemetery per Tissy's wishes, which again pisses me the fuck off. I think that the girls would have rolled over in their coffins to know that they were going to be put to rest in the Muslim cemetery. Looking at pictures of the cemetery that they're buried in and their headstones, this cemetery is just dark and creepy. Tissy's sister said that there was hardly any grass or flowers and that she begged her sister to please not leave the girls there. Yasser Saeed was able to flee and found himself on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Amina had said before she was murdered that if her father ever actually went through with it that he wouldn't go far, he would stay in Texas. Three years ago, a maintenance worker was called to fix a water leak at the Copper Canyon apartment complex in Bedford. Upon arrival, he found a man in the apartment that was leased to Islam Saeed. The manager was aware of Islam's fugitive father and contacted the FBI. 
Islam threw a fit when they tried to question him. The FBI came to raid the apartment with a warrant, but when they got there, it was empty. The patio door was left open and there were branches on a bush broken underneath of it like someone had jumped out recently. The FBI collected cigarette butts, eyeglasses, and a toothbrush that all proved to belong to Yasser Saeed. On August 27, 2020, Yasser Abdel Saeed was finally captured without incident. He was found hiding out in a home in Justin, Texas that had been under surveillance since about August 17th. The home was owned by Dalal Saeed, Yasser's niece. Police had spotted Islam and Yasin Saeed going in and out of the home with trash and disposing of it at a South Lake shopping center. They confiscated the trash after it was dumped for DNA proof that Yasser was, in fact, hiding in the home in Justin. Police executed a search warrant and found Yasser Saeed inside the home. Yasin and Islam were both arrested for harboring a fugitive the same day in Eulis, Texas. The FBI believes that there were more people involved in helping him evade capture. The FBI is offering a $100,000 reward to anyone who can provide information on others who aided and helped provide comfort to Yasser Abdel Saeed in the last 12 years. So my big question of the video, do you all think that the mother is at least partially to blame for the way that this transpired and ended? If the girls knew that their father was capable of murdering them, I find it completely ludicrous to think that their mother didn't see this coming from a mile away. Saeed definitely doesn't seem like the type of person to give a rat's ass what Tissy or any other woman thinks. He has no respect or tolerance for women. I highly doubt that he was feeding her lies and false hope. She knew how he felt and that his religion and culture made him believe what was right and what was wrong. I mean, honestly, regardless, she should be held accountable. I mean, we're talking about these young, poor, beautiful women's mother. The one person in the world who's always supposed to keep them safe no matter what that meant for her. She must have been either really naive or completely brainwashed to think that if they didn't return him, he would come and find them and kill them, but if they did return him, they would all live happily ever after. I honestly feel so strongly about Tissy's involvement that I'm asking all of you to please go sign a petition to have her brought in for questioning and to be looked at as a suspect. I put a link in the description box to the petition. If you feel as strongly as I do about this woman's involvement, please sign the petition. We're almost at our goal. I absolutely despise Tissy. She denies every allegation that's brought to her, and she's just completely fake. She denies that Yasser was adamant about arranging the girls to marry Egyptian men, and she even denies taking Amina to Egypt to meet some of these men. She denies the abuse against the kids, and it's really disgusting to me. She says that she hasn't agreed to take a polygraph because it would be a, quote, waste of her time, end quote. I most definitely think that at the very least she enabled this. I think she was way more involved than that, but I'll give her the benefit of the doubt because as of today, no charges have been pressed against Patricia Saeed. But I do hope, pray, and believe that charges are coming. Tissy's just a bold-faced liar. She'll say whatever she thinks is necessary to make herself look like a decent mom, or like she was a victim too. She says in one breath that Yasser Saeed's gonna be hunted down and get what's coming to him, but then she says in another breath that he's a gentle, loving man. There are pictures circulating of Yasser and Tissy where he's holding a knife to her throat. She cried while looking at the picture in one interview, saying that he had threatened her and said that this is what she had to look forward to if she ever disobeyed him. But then in another interview, when asked about the same picture, she said it was just for fun. There's another picture of her wearing a head wrap and holding a shotgun. She cried and said that he had forced her to take that picture but then shrugged it off in another interview, saying that they were just messing around and that he wasn't, quote, like serious or anything like that, end quote. If I ever loved him or I disobeyed him, this is what I have to look forward to. It was mainly for fun. It was, it was like a rifle. He forced me to put that stuff on. He wasn't serious or anything. I did not call Yasser. Yeah, That's when we called Yasser. Yeah, I am Muslim. I'm a Christian. There's even proof in her phone records that she called Yasser at 9.06 p.m. on January 1st, 2008, just hours after the girls were killed. She said she hadn't talked to Yasser and had only talked to Yasin once, but phone records don't lie. Since the girls' death, she's claimed to be a Muslim when speaking to one news station and then Christian when she speaks to another. Honor killing, or shame killing as it's sometimes referred to, is defined as homicide of a member of a family or social group due to the perpetrator's belief that the individual has brought dishonor or shame to their family or community. There are thought to be between five and 20,000 honor killings every year and the majority of these are against women. 
And everything that I've read says that Islam doesn't condone honor killings or any kind of murder for that matter. Yasser Saeed wasn't even very religious. He wasn't a devout Muslim and never went to church. This case is just such a tragedy and should have and could have been avoided. I'm going to pretty much wrap it up there, guys. If you have anything to add, please feel free to leave it below. If I missed anything or there's something that you want to talk about or expand on, I would really appreciate getting to talk about this a little bit. Like I said, this one's really messed me up. Like I said, I'm going to leave a tribute to the girls at the end of the video. Thank you for making it this far. I know this one's been rough. Amina had said several times that she overheard her dad talking to one of his brothers about how she was soon going to be just a memory. This became Amina's biggest fear. So let's not think of Amina and Sarah as a memory, but as two beautiful young women who had so much potential and had their whole lives ahead of them.